Ron Fazio from Clauston, New Jersey, got up as usual to head over to work at the World Trade Towers in New York City on September the 11th. He was vice president of a big corporation there that had its offices in the second tower of the Twin Towers, the South Tower, on the 99th floor. That morning, as that first jet came hurtling towards the towers, he happened to be looking out the window and thought it was coming for them. So he shouted to all of his employees on the 99th floor, get away from the windows, get down. And it passed them, as you know, and hit right into this first building, the north building, the first tower. And immediately, Ron turned to his employees and said, get out, go down the stairs now. Some thought he was overreacting over a tragic mistake. Of course, they didn't know it wasn't a mistake at the moment. But somehow, Ron intuited this is an attack. And so all of his employees were able to make it down that tower. When he got to the base of Tower 2, the South Building, he got to the door and started opening the door so that people could exit. Because, of course, then the second building was attacked. He was on the phone calling his family, telling them what he was doing, and then someone else asked for the phone, handed it to them to call his spouse, let her know he was alive, then handed the phone back, and then it went dead. Ron was never seen again. His body was never found as he opened the door to save other people's lives and did not leave that scene. His wife, Janet, and his children opened up a foundation in honor of their father's heroism called Hold the Door Open for Others, Incorporated. And in these past 20 years, not only have they served the victims, because as you know, we not only lost almost 3,000 that very moment, but there were another 6,000 who were physically wounded, and of those, at least 4,000 are dead now. So, so many have needed ministry over these 20 years, an ongoing opening of the door to love, sacrificial love, service of the neighbor. For faith without action as St. James teaches us in the gospel today, is dead. True faith is alive by the way we live it and act upon it. In the gospel today, we hear Jesus taking the apostles out of Israel. They've gone north of Israel. And it is there in the midst of so many different faiths, so many different cultures, so many what they call gods, at the time, Jesus puts the question, who do people say that I am? Sort of like an opinion poll. Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're the prophets to come, and so on and so forth. And then Jesus moves them to the deeper question. Who do you say that I am? Now he's not interested in the opinion poll. He really wasn't interested in that at all. He's just moving them to the important question the personal answer that each of us must give as we stand before Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. Who do you say that I am? And it was at that moment that St. Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And in Matthew's account, he records that at that moment, Jesus says to Peter, you are the rock. You are the rock. In other words, your act of faith is the rock foundation for all believers. Because that's truly who Jesus is. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And do we know that personally? Have we opened the doors of our hearts to Jesus by saying, welcome in, Lord? Now here's the strange thing. 
Jesus then follows that teaching by using what we heard in Isaiah about the suffering servant. Jesus is now going to reveal, okay, the Messiah, the anointed one, as had been prophesied long before by Isaiah, is also a suffering servant. This is how he's going to win the world. Not the way you would have designed it, I bet. Not the way I would have designed it. Certainly not the way Peter would have designed it or the other apostles. He says, they're going to take me. They're going to reject me. They're going to beat me. They're going to kill me. And then I will rise from the dead. And what does Peter do? The scripture says he has a fight with Jesus. They call it rebuke. You can imagine Peter saying, no way, Lord, they're not going to do that. We'll never let them do that. That's crazy. What a crazy idea for you. He's rebuking Jesus. Can you imagine? Rebuking Jesus. Telling Jesus, you're wrong. It's not the way to do it. And then what does the gospel say? Jesus rebukes him. He says, get behind me, Satan. Wow. At one moment, he's the hero. And a few lines down, he calls him Satan. Have you ever had a day when you felt like a split personality? (laughs) Well, St. Peter was in your shoes, right? At one moment, Jesus is honoring him, lifting him up, and now he calls him the divider, Satana, right? The evil one. Wow. And that's very possible for any of us. There's some days when we might... Be strong in the faith, and then at the next moment, we turn away from God. We surprise ourselves. Why did I do that? How did I do that? What got into me? Peter experienced it. But Jesus doesn't get rid of Peter. He doesn't say, you're fired. You're done. Get out. No. He keeps Peter. Because Jesus continues to work on the heart of Peter to become the man that he knows he can be, to become the saint that he knows he can be. And that call is for each one of us. It was a a young firefighter at 9-11, Tom Colucci. Loads of firefighters on that scene. He had just finished his shift. He was tired. He was heading back home when he got the emergency call. All on deck, right? All hands, everybody head toward the Twin Towers. We've been attacked. So Tom turns around, heads back, and he sees that moment. You may remember the chaplain to the fire department in New York City was a priest by the name of Father Michael Judge. And Father Judge went into the scene. He was there at the base of one of the towers. He was blessing the knights, not the knights, the, um, well, they're like knights, uh, the firemen that were going into the building, and as they were bringing out people, injured people, Father was blessing them as well. So he was there right on the scene, and then as the tower collapsed, he was one of the first that was killed. So they're carrying out Father Judge, Tom is coming in on the scene, and you can imagine, he knew him, What a nightmare he was walking into. And yet he went in like so many of those firefighters and saved as many lives as they could, as did Ron Fazio, saving his staff, running down 99 flights to life. Some years after the trauma, Tom Colucci, like so many, had to get counseling and the PTSD from this horror overwhelmed him. He eventually went to a Benedictine monastery in New York, spent a number of years there, and he came out of it with a vocation to the priesthood. Tom was ordained just a few years ago, after these many years, and he is now Father Tom Colucci. And as you might imagine, he has a special place in his heart for the firefighters and is a chaplain in the parish where he is serving today. But he said it was the image of the cross. Do you remember that image of the cross, that, the beams that survived? It's amazing. We have two of those beams, by the way, right here in town 
at Sacred Heart Church. Two of the beams that collapsed. You can go, if you haven't gone, it's a very moving experience, right? Uh, go down to Sacred Heart Church in Barelas, right here in the city of Albuquerque, and put your hand on that beam. And you don't know how many people were martyred coming down onto that beam 20 years ago yesterday. Father Tom Colucci said that when he saw that cross and when he experienced the cross of all those people who suffered and died, he knew that Jesus was knocking on the door of his heart. And he had to open that door to say, okay, Lord, I'm gonna take this new vocation. I'm retiring from the fire department. And now I'm going to take this new calling. God is continuously calling us, not just one time, but continuously. And we need to have the ears to hear in order to answer that call. And so this week, as we reflect on our call before the suffering servant who took all the ills of the world, physical suffering, mental anguish, moral crises, all of it. He took all of it to the cross as the suffering servant. That was his redemptive path. And he said that we have to carry our cross. Think of Simon of Cyrene, who was pushed into service to help Jesus carry the cross. Have you ever been a Simon of Cyrene for someone else? Jesus is calling us and we need to answer. I conclude with a poem entitled The Sonnet to the Crucified Christ by Lope de Vega. What have I that makes you seek my friendship? What could lead you, O oh my Jesus, to stand at my door covered with frost through the dark winter nights. Oh, how hard my heart was in not opening its door to you. What strange madness that the cold ice of my ingratitude should dry the wounds of your poor feet. How many times has my angel told me, soul, look out of your window right now and you'll see how lovingly he, he keeps knocking. And how many times, sovereign beauty, I answered, tomorrow will I open you to him, only to answer the very same thing the next day. Dear brothers and sisters, let it not be tomorrow. Let us not put Jesus off. Let us open the doors of our hearts to him today so that we might represent the crucified Savior in this world by his light and his grace. Mm -hmm.